Section one of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume One China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1. Palace of the Dalai Lama at Lhasa, Tibet. Photograph Frontispiece. Enclosed by nature between barren deserts and the loftiest peaks of the Himalayas, and barred to commerce by the most rigorous edicts against the admission of foreigners, Tibet remained virtually unknown until the eighteenth century. During the last hundred years, a few daring explorers traversed the country and in nineteen o four a mission from the indian government fought its way to the mysterious city of lhasa to offset the dreaded influence of russia with the court of tibet and to regulate trade with india the dalai lama fled he fled again a few years later when a chinese army entered the city returning in nineteen twelve lamaism the religion of tibet is a corrupt form of buddhism the dalai lama literally priest as great as the ocean who is the supreme pontiff is also the nominal ruler on the death of the dalai lama his soul is supposed to pass into the body of a newborn infant who thereby becomes his successor what child it is who thus automatically succeeds to the honor is determined by lot through strange and complicated ceremonies it is probable however that the final choice is made by the ruler of china who is overlord of tibet during the minority of the dalai lama the authority is exercised by a regent it is said that so many of the dalai lamas die mysteriously just before coming of age that the country is nearly always ruled by a regent the palace of the dalai lama is an enormous fortified structure of nearly five hundred rooms it is made of stone and whitewashed the upper half of the central part is crimson as are also the eaves and the coping of the zigzag steps in this building majestic without but dark and filthy within live three hundred and fifty lamas connected with it are other buildings for printing prayers casting bronze images manufacturing incense and keeping cattle tradition says that this immense edifice was reared some twelve hundred years ago this photograph of a temple little known to western readers was taken by dr s chuan of tientsin china who accompanied the chinese ambassador to lhasa end of section one this recording is in the public domain section two of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox .org by sonia publisher's note the scope of the world story is briefly suggested by its subtitle a history of the world in story song and art it is a series of selections from the best prose literature the most inspiring poetry and the most striking examples of historical painting made with a view to obtaining from these three sources a comprehensive and reasonably complete presentation of the world's history from the earliest recorded events to the present time it aims to utilize the writings of the best authors and the paintings of the greatest artists to present a series of pictures each interesting and instructive in itself and constituting as a whole an illuminating review of the most important events of the world's history art is relied upon to furnish its quota of material in precisely the same manner as literature one scene may be presented by means of the brush of a master painter while another may be the graphic word painting of some great author the selections are arranged in chronological order and under geographical divisions so that the reader may begin with the oldest known civilization that of the oriental countries and following the westward course of empire see in imagination the progress of civilization and something of the manners and customs of the people of all ages and of all parts of the world these selections represent the work of no less than six hundred representative authors and one hundred well-known artists by means of a series of historical notes and editorial introductions 
this vast assemblage of material is welded together into a homogeneous account of the world's history the selection and arrangement together with the editorial introductions and explanations are the work of eva march tappan well known as the author of many volumes of popular history and as the editor of the children's hour she has devoted more than three years to the search for suitable material and has brought together one thousand one hundred selections many of them from books ordinarily inaccessible to the general reader the final volume of the series is an outline of universal history outlining in brief the important events and giving the names of rulers and leaders with dates from the earliest time down to the date of publication in addition there are alphabetical indexes of titles and authors and a general index of all the famous characters and events mentioned in the selections pains have been taken to indicate in the table of contents the sources from which the selections have been made by this means a reference guide is provided to the world's best historical literature and the reader is enabled to extend his study in the portions of the field found most interesting the world's story offers to the general reader a new and agreeable way of reviewing the history of civilization the publishers believe that it will prove of special value to all who for any reason are unable to give the time to a comprehensive study of the vast literature of history but who will be glad to get from their historical reading the same delight that one expects to derive from the reading of novels and poems end of section two this recording is in the public domain section three of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by sonia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section three introduction did you ever stop to consider how the average person becomes acquainted with the history of his own land few people even among the most patriotic have ever read a full and complete work on the story of their country but yet in some mysterious way they have acquired a working knowledge of its annals something of this they gain in even the elementary schools of course but such knowledge of facts is quite a different matter from the feeling of friendly familiarity of being at home in the chronicles of our motherland that comes to most of us in greater or less degree this is our birthright we gain possession of it less by studying than simply by living among our own people we hear legends a blood-curdling narrative of an escape from the indian tomahawk the story of the diary of marie antoinette the tale of the hiding away of some priest or cavalier the tradition of bishop hatto and his tower we read here and there an anecdote of wellington or peter the great or hideyoshi we hear stories of the recent wars from the lips of veterans the relief of lucknow tells us something of the indian mutiny john brown's body of the american civil war the charge of the light brigade of the crimi byron's eve of waterloo of the fall of napoleon the idols of the king gives us a living king arthur the earl of rochester's epitaph on charles the second is an exceedingly good characterization of the merry monarch there are hohenlinden and the battle of the baltic indeed there is no end to the poems that bring the past before us in glowing colors the daily papers are full of phrases that originated in some historical event england expects every man to do his duty forty centuries are looking down upon you prairie schooners forty-niners the cat and mouse law the vicar of bray all these arose from some episode in history proper names too are wonderfully suggestive why is there a ponce de leon hotel in florida how did whitehall street and trafalgar square and west indies alexandria constantinople alhambra pittsburgh the theatre of pompey and the avenue de neuilly get their names there are monuments that are history condensed there is a lion at lucerne horses at st mark's 
there is a lofty shaft on bunker hill a statue of william penn on the top of the city hall of philadelphia there are monuments to wolfe and montcalm to brock frontenac and champlain to washington sir harry vane joan of arc alfred the great wellington richard the lion-hearted indeed we can hardly walk a mile in any city without reading in statue or column or name of street or square or building some chapter in local history our most familiar pictures are historical who does not know the princes in the tower charlotte corday the return of the mayflower queen victoria ascending the steps of the throne napoleon on the bellerophon the death of nelson alfred in the herdsman's cottage so it is in these and a hundred similar ways of which we take little account that the history of our homeland comes to us such knowledge is necessarily incomplete and somewhat fragmentary we do not know the exact latitude and longitude of the spot where the constitution encountered the guerriere perhaps we have even forgotten the year when the famous battle took place but we are reasonably sure to remember that the familiar name of the first mentioned vessel was old ironsides and that holmes wrote a poem with that title unconsciously we join our bits of information together and when we read even the barest outline of our country's history then no matter what our homeland may be we are sure to find these stories and pictures and songs these memories of statues and streets and monuments and names and phrases thronging into our minds and taking their proper places in its chronicles the brief and uninteresting annals throb with interest in proportion as we are able to put something of our own between the lines they become our story and by the aid of a gleam of imagination it is almost the record of our own experiences this is the natural method of learning history it is the way in which we become acquainted with our friends it is the way in which we form for ourselves the image of any person or place that we have not seen if we would form a mental likeness of queen elizabeth for instance we must bring together her genuine devotion to england her ability to choose great ministers her vanity temper love of magnificence and gorgeousness her neglected girlhood her delight in flattery her deceitfulness and her political sagacity these traits and many others come to our minds one by one and with the coming of each we gain a new idea of her character and finally form a mental image of a woman of such traits and such peculiarities but we have only one mother country only one life in which to grow up into the knowledge and history of a land to learn as children her monuments and streets and her memorial phrases to gaze upon her relics to hear from the lips of her people the tales of events within their own recollection our knowledge of other lands must come chiefly through books macaulay says the effect of historical reading is analogous in many respects to that produced by foreign travel the student like the tourist is transported into a new state of society he sees new fashions he hears new modes of expression his mind is enlarged by contemplating the wide diversities of laws of morals and of manners by diligent study one may of course learn the history of a country but is it possible to acquire in some degree the feeling of easy familiarity with the story of a foreign land which we have with that of our own and what means shall we employ in the attempt first of all we may make use of the great historical paintings of the world each one flashing a light upon some chapter of the past in jerome's police verso for instance the scene is in the Colosseum, where the victor stands with sword in hand and foot upon the breast of his conquered adversary the galleries are gorgeous with carvings tapestry brilliant costumes beautiful women and gallant men some of the spectators are a little bored by the familiarity of the entertainment some care for nothing but the display of their own charms the centre of interest is that portion of the gallery which is occupied by the vestal virgins women whose office of honour and sanctity is the care of the worship of vesta the goddess of the burning hearth of the love the quiet the purity of the ideal home they are robed in significant white 
the richest of tapestries hang over the rail before them the wishes of these virgins are so respected that upon their will really depends the life or death of the man who lies under the mailed heel of the victor the conqueror stands gazing upward for their decision the crowds beyond the royal seats peer around to see what it shall be and the venerated women stretch out their beautifully moulded arms and with thumbs pointing downward pollice verso demand the slaughter of the man whose upraised hand pleads for mercy this is an impressive picture of a thrilling moment it is also a chapter in history here we read the bravery and fearlessness of the romans their inherited respect for the servants of the gods their self-restraint and obedience to the law even in the excitement of a moral struggle and their attainments in the arts and in appreciation of luxury and magnificence but there is another side to the picture here is also the roman cruelty the roman obliviousness to the sufferings of others there are smiles and jesting there is curiosity to learn the wishes of the virgins but there is nowhere a gleam of pity for the man who lies writhing in agony here are indicated long periods of history the history of a warlike unfeeling conquering race obedient to law and of great wealth and material progress one may even glance onward from the moment of the picture and prophesy that a nation whose fetish is law rather than justice and mercy cannot long rule the world companion to this is the last token by gabriel max here is again a bit of the arena but now a young girl a christian martyr is the roman victim she stands among savage leopards and hyenas ready to spring upon her she knows her fate and asks no mercy but far up in the seats above some loving friend has dropped at her feet a rose the last token and with one hand on the wall to balance her swaying steps she forgets for the instant the death that lies before her and gazes upward to the face of the friend whose love will help her to meet the horrors of the next moment here too is history and also prophecy a new element has entered into roman life spiritual courage rather than physical is winning admiration the leaven of sympathy for pain and suffering is working in the pitiless roman character this too is not only a vivid painting but a chapter of history there is a vast amount of history in songs and poems he who writes the songs of a nation rules the nation is an old saying but is it not nearer the truth to say that the song is the heart of the people their wishes and their resolutions the thoughts of the many put into the words of the one such songs as the watch on the rhine the marseillaise god save the king my country tis of thee man of harlech hale's marching song of stark's men burns bruce at bannockburn browning's song of the cavaliers do not portray events but they do arouse the spirit which brought them into being and thus by a most delicate but most irresistible method they teach history by bringing us into the spirit of the circumstances which inspired their writers the more descriptive poems such as chevy chase macaulay's battle of naseby scott's bonnie dandy the star-spangled banner drayton's agincourt byron's destruction of sennacherib macaulay's horatius at the bridge may not indeed have the minute and mechanical accuracy of a photograph but they vivify the action they so arouse the imagination that we almost feel ourselves a part of the event this too is history and it is in reality far nearer original sources than some of the contemporary and uninspired accounts accurate in every detail though they be which form the body to perfection but forget to add the spirit historical paintings and poems however are limited in number not every episode in the history of a country appeals to the painter neither does it to the poet but the story-teller is ever at hand if a tale is worth narrating there is always some one eager to tell it usually there are many and we may choose among numerous versions the well-written historical story whether it stands alone or whether it comes from the heart of some ponderous publication of many volumes takes time to linger to describe to picture 
to trace the details that make for vividness that give a conviction of truth it is to narrative then that we must turn for our most unfailing help in trying to win familiarity with the chronicles of other countries we must search not only for thrilling tales of battles and conspicuous deeds of heroism but for the simple annals of the masses of the people moreover what were looked upon at the time of their occurrence as important events are not invariably those which time has proved to be of the utmost significance in the middle of the fifteenth century the coronation of frederick the third at rome would have seemed of far more significance than the fact that an unknown workman should be experimenting in an obscure little shop on an invention which must have struck the copyists of the monastery book-rooms as trivial and unnecessary nevertheless the occupation of the copyist is long since vanished and no one remembers much about frederick the third but gutenberg's printing has revolutionized the world but the history of a country is by no means made up of events even such important ones as the invention of printing what people thought of the occurrences of their own day is always interesting and does much to bring us into the spirit of the times in which they lived stray sentences from letters are pictures and chapters of history together after cabot returned to england from his discoveries in america the venetian ambassador wrote home honors are heaped upon cabot he is called grand admiral he is dressed in silk and the english run after him like madmen could anything make one feel more like a spectator than this one sentence with its slight disdain of the english enthusiasm and possibly a bit of patriotic jealousy of the fortunate country under whose auspices cabot had set sail there are two classes of historical narrations both of which may well find a place in conveying knowledge of the past they may either be made up of facts alone or they may cast about those facts that richness and glow of the imagination which make yesterday seem like to-day the first class of stories may indeed hardly differ from an account or description save that they as far as possible tell the tale of some distinct episode and have a definite beginning middle and end both must be interesting vivid and correct both must be true to the known facts but the second has the opportunity to picture not only a special event but also the human feelings circling around that event and therefore may be true in a wider sense than the first for instance the heroine of cur vadis the beautiful ligia never existed neither did her gigantic protector the powerful ursus but both are drawn in accordance with what such persons were likely to be in those times their pathetic experiences and thrilling adventures are such things as did occur therefore this portrayal is as true as a list of dates but it is broadly humanly true it is history but it is history made vivid by the author's dramatic presentation and skilful drawing of character even in folklore and fable there is truth in plenty and no history can safely overlook them and the facts that they suggest emerson says the beautiful fables of the greeks are universal verities the fairy tales of the little brown gnomes of england for instance who hid themselves in holes by day and who were in constant dread of the touch of iron may well suggest the men of the stone age and their fear of those who had learned to work in metals the truth of this sort of story rests less upon what it tells than upon what it indicates for instance it is quite possible that king arthur never had a round table perhaps there never was any king arthur but the tales of his prowess and that of his knights indicate faithfully the stubborn resistance of the britons to the conquering saxons in like manner it may well be that there never was any living tangible robin hood but the legends of his seizing from the rich and bestowing upon the poor typify the restlessness of his supposed times and the vague feeling of the masses of the people that he who possessed a shilling was necessarily the oppressor of him who possessed none the impossible exploits of the cid are not in themselves facts but they make vivid in most picturesque fashion the sort of man who was a hero to the spaniards of the eleventh century history takes all knowledge to be its province the physical geography of a country is an important part of its story 
that of greece for example was such as to shut in by ranges of mountains little groups of people each in its separate valley and forbid the ease of intercourse that would have made for a lasting union among them in latium on the other hand the clustering together of some hills of moderate height made possible the powerful roman state the manners and customs of a people are a part of its history and so are their pleasures even the sports and games of their children the homes of the people their physical skill which manages a kayak or their intellectual ability which controls an ocean liner their inventions and discoveries their ideals of greatness all these are parts of the history of a nation it is with such thoughts in mind that these volumes of the world's story have been compiled he who reads them may wander from country to country purely for amusement as a luxurious traveller might do he may make a study of his reading and compare the customs the heroes the achievements and the ideals of the various lands or he may if he will take these for a starting point and strike out roads of his own through the spacious realms of the story of the world which to him who will but read it aright is forever old and yet forever new eva march tappan end of section three this recording is in the public domain Section four of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. China, Part One. In the Earliest Days. Historical Note. According to Chinese mythology, there was once a mighty egg, wherein there dwelt a living being known as Poon Kuong. Suddenly, this egg broke into two parts. The upper became the heavens, and the lower the earth poon ku wong stretched forth his right hand and behold the sun was created he stretched forth his left and the moon and the stars were made at the feet of poon ku wong lay a piece of gold and a piece of wood he breathed upon them and straightway two clouds arose in the vapour from the gold stood man and in that from the wood stood woman and from these two have come all the people of all the world tradition says that nearly three thousand years before the birth of christ a tribe of wanderers made their way from the west to what is now the province of shansi and began to cultivate the ground one ruler followed another and each taught his people something of value one showed them how to make huts by weaving together the boughs of trees another rubbed two sticks together and produced fire a third chanced to build a fire on the dark brown soil and when the flames had died away there lay bits of metal among the ashes and these were iron later another ruler invented the plough and the wife of yet another unwound the thread of the silkworm spun it and wove it into a web of silk far more startling than these exploits was the feat of one chin nung who is declared to have discovered in one day seventy species of poisonous plants and also an antidote for every one of them behind these stories we can see the wandering tribes of herdsmen slowly developing into tillers of the soil and forming a compact nation as the centuries pass their history grows clearer until in the twelfth century b c china at length emerges from the twilight land of legend as a civilized nation with a feudal government very similar to that of japan end of section four this recording is in the public domain Section 5 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 5 shun of you who control the floods by confucius the most famous man that ever lived in china was the philosopher confucius he studied the ancient records picked out everything that he thought was worth saving and put his information together in the shu king or history book 
his story begins in two thousand three hundred fifty six b c when yao the model emperor was on the throne the editor the emperor said who will search out for me a man according to the times whom i may raise and employ fang tse said there is your heir son chu who is highly intelligent the emperor said alas he is insincere and quarrelsome can he do the emperor said who will search out for me a man equal to the exigency of my affairs one tao said oh there is the minister of works whose merits have just been displayed in various ways the emperor said alas when unemployed he can talk but when employed his actions turn out differently he is respectful only in appearance see the floods assail the heavens the emperor said o chief of the four mountains destructive in their overflow are the waters of the inundation in their vast extent they embrace the mountains and overtop the hills threatening the heavens with their floods so that the inferior people groan and murmur is there a capable man to whom i can assign the correction of this calamity all in the court said oh there is kwan the emperor said alas no by no means he is disobedient to orders and tries to injure his peers his eminence said well but try him and then you can have done with him the emperor said to kwan go and be reverent for nine years he labored but the work was unaccomplished the emperor said o oh, you chief of the four mountains i have been on the throne for seventy years you can carry out my appointments i will resign my throne to you his eminence said i have not the virtue i should only disgrace the imperial seat the emperor said point out some one among the illustrious or set forth one from among the poor and mean all in court said to the emperor there is an unmarried man among the lower people called shun of you the emperor said yes i have heard of him what is his character his eminence said he is the son of a blind man his father was obstinately unprincipled his stepmother was insincere his half-brother shang was arrogant he has been able however by his filial piety to live in harmony with them and to lead them gradually to self-government so that they no longer proceed to great wickedness the emperor said i will try him i will wife him and then see his behavior with my two daughters on this he gave orders and sent down his two daughters to the north of the quay to be wives in the family of you the emperor said to them be reverent you appears before the emperor to make his report the emperor said come you you also must have admirable words to bring before me you did obeisance and said oh what can i say after kao yao o emperor i can only think of maintaining a daily assiduity kao yao said alas will you describe it you said the inundating waters seem to assail the heavens and in their vast extent embrace the mountains and overtop the hills so that people were bewildered and overwhelmed i mounted my four conveyances and all along the hills hewed down the woods at the same time showing the multitudes how to get flesh to eat i also opened passages for the streams throughout the nine provinces and conducted them to the sea i deepened moreover the channels and canals and conducted them to the streams at the same time along with tse sowing grain and showing the multitudes how to procure the food of toil in addition to flesh meat i urged them further to exchange what they had for what they had not and to dispose of their accumulated stores in this way all the people got grain to eat and all the states began to come under good rule kao yao said yes we ought to model ourselves after your excellent words 
a story has been handed down that in memory of hugh's feat of engineering a record was cut on a rock high up on one of the mountains of sacrifice whether this is true or not no one can say but some of the chinese historians have the utmost confidence in the tradition the venerable emperor said o aid and counsellor who will help me in administering my affairs the great and little islands that is the inhabited places even to their summits the abodes of the beasts and birds and all beings are widely inundated advise send back the waters and raise the dikes for a long time i have quite forgotten my family i repose on the top of the mountain yolu by prudence and my labours i have moved the spirits i know not the hours but repose myself only in my incessant labours the mountains hua yo tai and hung have been the beginning and end of my enterprise when my labours were completed i offered a thanksgiving sacrifice at the solstice my affliction has ceased the confusion in nature has disappeared the deep currents coming from the south flow into the sea clothes can now be made food can be prepared all kingdoms will be at peace and we can give ourselves to continual joy for many years yu continued to show himself wise and sagacious and devoted to the welfare of the kingdom one day the emperor sent for him and the following conversation took place the emperor said you i have occupied the imperial throne for thirty and three years i am between ninety and a hundred years old and the laborious duties weary me do you eschewing all indolence take the leadership of my people you said my virtue is not equal to the position the people will not repose in me but there is kao yao with vigorous activity sowing abroad his virtue which has descended on the black-haired people till they cherish him in their hearts o emperor think of him when i think of him my mind rests on him as the man for this office when i would put him out of my thoughts they still rest on him when i name and speak of him my mind rests on him for this the sincere outgoing of my thoughts about him is that he is the man o emperor think of his merits the emperor said kao yao that of these my ministers and people hardly one is found to offend against the regulations of my government is owing to your being the minister of crime and intelligent in the use of the five punishments to assist the inculcation of the five duties with a view to the perfection of my government and that through punishment there may come to be no punishments but the people accord with the path of the mean continue to be strenuous kao yao said your virtue o emperor is faultless you condescend to your ministers with a liberal ease you preside over the multitude with a generous forbearance punishments do not extend to the criminal's heirs while rewards reach to after generations you pardon inadvertent faults however great and punish purposed crimes however small in cases of doubtful crimes you deal with them lightly in cases of doubtful merit you prefer the high estimation rather than put to death an innocent person you will run the risk of irregularity and error this life-loving virtue has penetrated the minds of the people and this is why they do not render themselves liable to be punished by your officers the emperor said to enable me to follow after and obtain what i desire in my government the people everywhere responding as if moved by the wind this is your excellence the emperor said come you the inundating waters filled me with dread when you realized all that you represented and accomplished your task thus showing your superiority to other men without any prideful presumption there is not one in the empire to contest with you the palm of ability without any boasting there is not one in the empire to contest with you the claim of merit i see how great is your virtue how admirable your vast achievements the determinate appointment of heaven rests on your person you must eventually ascend the throne of the great sovereign 
the mind of man is restless prone to err its affinity for the right way is small be discriminating be undivided that you may sincerely hold fast the mean do not listen to unsubstantiated words do not follow undeliberated plans of all who are to be loved is not the sovereign the chief of all who are to be feared are not the people chief if the multitude were without the sovereign whom should they sustain aloft if the sovereign had not the multitude there would be none to guard the country for him be reverent carefully demean yourself on the throne which you will occupy respectfully cultivating the virtues which are to be desired in you if within the four seas there be distress and poverty your heaven conferred revenues will come to a perpetual end it is the mouth which sends forth what is good and gives rise to war my words i will not repeat you said submit the meritorious ministers one by one to the trial of divination and let the fortunate indication be followed the emperor said you the officer of divination when the mind has been made up on a subject then refers it to the great tortoise now in this matter my mind was determined in the first place i consulted and deliberated with all my ministers and people and they were of one accord with me the spirits signified their assent the tortoise and grass having both concurred divination when fortunate may not be repeated you did obeisance with his head to the ground and firmly declined the throne the emperor said do not do so it is you who can suitably occupy my place on the first morning of the first month you received the appointment in the temple of the spiritual ancestor and took the leading of all the officers as had been done at the commencement of the emperor's government End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. China, Part 2 Confucius and His Age historical note the period of the chow dynasty eleven twenty two to two fifty five b c is the golden age of china it is marked by the development of literature and art and by the teachings of the philosophers the first of the great sages was lao tse founder of the taoist religion with his watchword of tao reason his fame is obscured however by that of his disciple confucius whose writings have probably had greater influence than those of any other human being mencius the last of the classic philosophers was later than confucius by about one hundred years end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section seven the story of confucius by rev a w loomis five forty nine to four seventy six b c confucius as a sage and religious teacher is regarded by his countrymen as the greatest man china has produced he was unquestionably an extraordinary man remarkable in the influence he exercised over his countrymen when alive and the still greater influence he has ever since exercised by his writings 
confucius was born about five hundred and forty nine years before christ in the kingdom of lu a portion of northeastern china nearly corresponding with the modern province of shantung at that time china was divided into nine independent states and it was not till three centuries later that it was united into one kingdom from his earliest years confucius was distinguished by an eager pursuit of knowledge from his father who was prime minister of the state in which he lived he inherited a taste for political studies but being left an orphan when still but a child he was educated for the most part in retirement by his mother ching and his grandfather koum tsi the anecdotes which are related of his boyhood tend to show that he was distinguished by those qualities most highly esteemed by his countrymen and afterwards most strictly enforced by himself a profound reverence for his parents and ancestors and for the teaching of the ancient sages Kuamtsi, his grandfather says one of his biographers was one day sitting absorbed in a melancholy reverie in the course of which he fetched several deep sighs the child observing him after some time approached and with many bows and formal reverences spoke thus if i may presume without violating the respect i owe you sir to inquire into the cause of your grief i would gladly do so perhaps you fear that i who am descended from you may reflect discredit on your memory by failing to imitate your virtues his grandfather surprised asked him where he had learned to speak so wisely from yourself sir he replied i listen attentively to your words and i have often heard you say that a son who does not imitate the virtues of his ancestors deserves not to bear their name the position which his father had held in the state seems to have inspired confucius at an early age with a desire to distinguish himself in moral and political studies and prompted him to investigate the early history of his country he laboured zealously to fit himself for filling offices of high political trust and in his endeavours to master the learning of the early sages he was ably assisted by his grandfather he married at nineteen years of age and is said to have divorced his wife a few years afterwards when she had given birth to a son that he might devote himself without interruption to study but owing to the general contempt of women in the east the subject is only slightly alluded to by his biographers he entered upon political employment at twenty years of age as superintendent of cattle an office probably established that the revenue might not be defrauded and necessary where much of it was paid in kind in this situation his reverence for antiquity and the ancients did not prevent confucius from attempting reforms and checking long-established abuses under his administration men who were dishonest were dismissed and a general inquiry was set on foot with a view to the reformation of all that was unworthy or pernicious the activity of confucius brought him into favour with his sovereign and he was promoted to the distribution of the grain an office of which it is not easy to discover the nature whatever were his duties however the energy that confucius displayed was extremely distasteful to his colleagues he was now in the vigorous manhood of thirty-five and the eyes of the nation were turned to him as their future prime minister when a revolution occurred in the state which drove him from power deprived of his office he wandered for eight years through the various provinces of china teaching as he went but without as yet making any great impression upon the mass of the people he returned to lu in his forty-third year his enemies during those eight years had gradually lost their authority and he was again employed in political offices of trust and responsibility immorality prevailed at this time to a frightful extent confucius set himself up fearlessly as a teacher of virtue 
his admonitions were not thrown away and having gained the approbation of the king a few years after his return from exile he was appointed prime minister with almost absolute authority the enemies of order and virtue excited troubles on his elevation but confucius sternly repressed the symptoms of dissatisfaction and though of compassionate disposition he did not hesitate to resort to capital punishment when necessary to rid himself of his enemies reformation made rapid strides in the territories of lu the nobles became more just and equitable the poor were not oppressed as before roads bridges and canals were formed the food of the people says his biographer was the first care it was not until that had been secured in abundance that the revenues of the state were directed to the advancement of commerce the improvement of the bridges and highways the impartial administration of justice and the repression of the bands of robbers that infested the mountains for four years he steadily persevered in his endeavors until lu began to be regarded as a model state by the surrounding kingdoms at length however a strong party rose against the sage and at the age of fifty-seven he was driven once more from his native state to wander as a teacher through the different provinces of china on leaving lu confucius first bent his steps westward to the state of wai situate about where the present provinces of chi lei and honan adjoin he was now in his fifty-eighth year and felt depressed and melancholy as he went along he gave expression to his feelings in verse fain would i still look towards lu but this kwai hill cuts off my view with an axe i'd hew these thickets through vain thought gainst the hill i naught can do and again through the valley howls the blast drizzling rain falls thick and fast homeward goes the youthful bride o'er the wild crowds by her side how is it o oh, azure heaven from my home i thus am driven through the land my way to trace with no certain dwelling-place dark dark the minds of men worth in vain comes to their ken hasten on my term of years old age desolate disappears it was only by concealment and disguise that the life of the exiled prime minister was preserved for twelve years he wandered from province to province at first harassed persecuted hunted but after a while allowed to travel unmolested a faithful little band of disciples collected around him in his wanderings and their numbers as time advanced might soon be counted by thousands seventy-two of these we are told were particularly attached to him but only ten of them were truly wise with these ten he finally retired at the age of sixty-nine to a peaceful valley in his native province where in the midst of his disciples he passed a happy literary period of five years in collating and annotating the works of the ancients these sacred books have been for twenty-three centuries the fountains of wisdom and goodness to all the educated of china they are the works in which every student must be a proficient ere he can hope to advance in the political arena and for twenty-three centuries have had an incalculable influence on a third of the human race his life was peacefully concluded in the midst of his friends at the age of seventy-three in the valley to which he had retired five years previously a few days before his death he tottered about the house singing out tai shan kai tui hu liang mu ki kwai hu chi jin ki wai hu the great mountain is broken the strong beam is thrown down the wise man has decayed he died soon after leaving a single descendant his grandson tsitsi 
through whom the succession has been transmitted to the present day during his life the return of the jews from babylon the invasion of greece by xerxes and the conquest of egypt by the persians took place posthumous honours in great variety amounting to idolatrous worship have been conferred upon him his title is the most holy ancient teacher Kungzi, and the holy duke in the reign of Kangji, two thousand one hundred and fifty years after his death there were eleven thousand males alive bearing his name and most of them of the seventy-fourth generation being undoubtedly one of the oldest families in the world in the sacrificial ritual a short account of his life is given which closes with the following paean confucius confucius how great is confucius before confucius there never was a confucius since confucius there never has been a confucius 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 how great is confucius the peaceful valley in which he died has been for all succeeding ages a sacred spot a spot of pilgrimage for the learned and the superstitious and the chinese of eighteen sixty seven amid conflicting buddhism taoism and roman catholicism still point with reverence to the tomb of their great sage in the province of shantung End of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section eight a visit to a temple of confucius by rev a w loomis we now pushed on to kiu fu hien the city of confucius which we reached about two thirty p m this city is peopled chiefly by the descendants of the great sage eight families out of ten bearing his surname it has two south gates the one on the west side being unused and opened only on the visit of an emperor this gate is in front of the temple of confucius and leads directly to it the temple occupied a large portion of the western part of the city the chief part of it standing on the place where confucius lived its arrangement resembles that usually adopted in buildings of a similar class in china but on a grander and more superb scale take it all in all i have seen nothing like it in other parts of china the enclosure is oblong the building is thirteen halls deep one square is shut off from another by grand gates there are also two bridges crossed by a grand avenue leading from the magnificent south gate through the inner gates and on to the main temple the squares are full of tall old cypress trees and the sides of the avenue are crowded with tablets in honour of the sage every dynasty is here represented and many of the tablets were thus extremely important early in the morning we set out to view this place a small fee soon opened the door and we found the keeper obliging the temple is divided in two parts by a thoroughfare for the convenience of the citizens to avoid a long circuit the chief objects of interest lying on the north side to this we went and from the first moment we stepped in to the last my whole mind was engaged by objects of interest here on the left hand was a cypress said to have been planted by confucius himself and its gnarled and aged trunk bore evidence of its great age here we were shown the place where he taught his disciples now a huge pavilion open to the south in it was fixed in his praise a poem composed by kien lung engraved on a marble tablet 
now appeared the grand temple a high building for china and a most spacious one it was two-storied the upper veranda on gorgeous marble pillars these pillars were at least twenty-two feet high and about ten feet in diameter around them carved in the solid stone twined two large dragons the marble itself was richly veined the tiles of the roof were of yellow porcelain as in peking and the ornamentation of the eaves was all covered with wire-work to preserve it from the birds within this building was the image or statue of confucius like that of mencius only in far richer style he sat in a gorgeously curtained shrine holding a roll in his hand or rather a slip of bamboo as it was this material that was used for writing in his days the sitting statue was about eighteen feet by six feet the image was well done and lifelike he is represented as a strong well-built man with a full red face and large head a little heavy he sits in the attitude of contemplation his eyes looking upwards he has a much more serious thoughtful aspect than mencius but not that straightforward dogged air which the latter bore his front teeth were exposed his nose thick and round on the tablet was the simple inscription the most holy prescient sage confucius his spirit's resting place on the east were images of his favourite disciples ranged in order in the estimation in which he was said to have held them that of mencius occupied the west side of the building the roof was crowded with tablets in honour of the sage vying with one another in extravagant praise before his image and also in front of these were beautiful incense pots amongst them several most interesting relics here was a clay dish said to be of yao's time also two bronze censers one with a lid bearing the date of the shang dynasty the work on which was superb two bronze elephants dating from the chow dynasty stood by and a large table of the same age made of beautiful hard dark redwood these things spoke volumes for the state of the nation in those far back ages the moulding and carving were most exquisite behind this hall stands a temple in honour of the wife of confucius in it was a tablet but no image in the second temple yet farther back are four tablets erected by kang sai bearing each one of the characters which together mean the teacher of ten thousand ages here also were three engraved figures of the sage on marble one an old man full length rather dim having no date the second smaller with seal characters on the side the third and best giving only his head and shoulders these varied somewhat but were substantially alike all of them gave the mouth or lips open the front teeth exposed and the eyes full and contemplative immediately behind these were incised drawings on marble illustrating all the chief incidents in his life with appropriate explanations at the side there were altogether one hundred and twenty slabs which were built into the back wall the greater part of them were in good preservation and were extremely interesting the more so as they gave us an insight into the dress kind of furniture carriages and houses of those ancient times to the west of this are two temples that in front in honour of the father of the sage who is said to have governed yen chao fu and sao hien the other in honour of his mother they are plain temples and have no images only a tablet each on the east are also temples to his five ancestors here towards the east was a large block of marble on which was engraven a genealogical tree giving all the branches of his family here was also a well from which the sage drank i got the man to let down a bucket and tasted the water which was excellent though a little swedish on this side also was another building which he is said to have used as his school 
the southern division is less interesting than the northern it contains nothing but what i have already named tablets innumerable cypress trees gates walls and bridges there are three gardens four gates and two bridges the duke kung the present head of the family lives in a mansion adjoining the temple on the west end of section eight this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section nine of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke some of the proverbs of confucius it is said that after the death of confucius his disciples bewailed his absence until they had all lost their voices then they set to work to bring together what they could remember of his teachings the editor four horses cannot overtake the tongue injury should be recompensed with kindness a man should say i am not concerned that i have no place i am concerned how i may fit myself for one i am not concerned that i am not known i seek to be worthy to be known to be fond of learning is to be near to knowledge seek not every quality in one individual the master said you shall i teach you what knowledge is when you know a thing to hold that you know it and when you do not know a thing to allow that you do not know it this is knowledge what i do not wish men to do to me i also wish not to do to men to see what is right and not to do it is a want of courage the superior man is distressed by his want of ability he is not distressed by men's not knowing him the master said virtue is more to man than either water or fire i have seen men die from treading on water or fire but i have never seen a man die from treading the course of virtue the superior man thinks of virtue the small man thinks of comfort there were four things from which the master was entirely free he had no foregone conclusions no arbitrary predeterminations no obstinacy and no egotism End of section nine this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section ten of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section ten manners and customs of confucius's day by rev william spear the northern part of the country was still divided into the several small principalities which had been granted by the emperors at different times to their sons and brothers who constituted the only hereditary nobility of the state and were all tributary to the chief sovereign each of these petty states contained a city where the prince resided and all around it were numerous villages and detached dwellings inhabited by the peasantry who held small farms which they cultivated for their own advantage growing rice and vegetables in abundance so that every poor man could support his family by his own industry 
they were not held in bondage by the great like the peasantry of europe during the feudal ages and amongst other privileges which they enjoyed were these a ninth part of the land was in common amongst them for pasturage and farming and all the poor were at liberty to fish in the ponds and lakes a right which was denied to the lower orders in feudal countries where the mass of the people were vassals and slaves the peasants of china therefore appear to have been at that period in a better condition than those of any other part of the world working for themselves and paying taxes to their respective princes who by that means raised the tribute which the emperor claimed of them at the time of confucius all taxes and tribute were paid as they are at present chiefly in kind usually as mencius who lived in the next generation says to the amount of about one-tenth of the produce of the earth it is however supposed there was always some sort of coined money current among the chinese and that at a very early period of the monarchy they had coins of gold and silver as well as of lead iron and copper but many ages have elapsed since any other than copper money has been in use among them silver is also used as a medium of exchange beaten out into small bars or pieces and upon these responsible traders generally put their stamp in a small character so that they become in time particularly ragged and broken yet even in these bits adroit rogues make holes which they fill with lead in buying and selling men always scrutinize them carefully and weigh them being always provided with a small pair of scales for that purpose they reckon their accounts by means of an instrument called in the canton dialect the sampan which resembles the roman abacus it consists of a frame across which are fastened thin rods of bamboo but instead of ten balls as with us the chinese use seven a cross-bar divides the frame so that the rods have on one side five balls each on the other side two each the two balls on each rod count however five apiece this makes the process of counting more rapid and certain commencing at any convenient rod or row it counts as units the second as tens the third as hundreds the fourth as thousands and so on to count five either the five balls on the lower side of the unit's row are pushed up or to the middle with the finger or one of the two balls on the other side of it ten is made by the two five balls or by one of them and five of the other balls and thus we go on in each row successively for tens hundreds or thousands for any number between five and ten a five ball is pushed to the middle and the remainder in single balls from the other end of the same row an expert accountant pushes the balls with his fingers as rapidly in adding or subtracting as a player strikes the keys upon a piano it is rarely a mistake is made and when done it is never to the disadvantage of the accountant the invention of the sun pun is attributed to the emperor wang ti the same who is said to have found his way through the forests by means of the compass their arithmetic as well as their weights and measures proceeds universally on the decimal scale and decimal fractions are their vulgar fractions or those in common use it is remarkable that the single exception to this consists in their kin or marketing pound weight which like ours is divided into sixteen ounces or parts this affords another illustration of the common origin of the chinese and our own arithmetic and weights and measures in central asia the roman catholic missionaries relate that when the first of them went to china from europe they found persian astronomers at the chinese court who yielded the field to their superior scientific knowledge there are still many things in the chinese ideas of astronomy which remind us of those of the ancient chaldeans
there were public markets in the towns to which the people generally resorted about noon and there were shops also where the artisans pursued their various callings and sold or exchanged with the farmers the produce of their labours for rice and other commodities of which they stood in need beyond the cultivated lands were pastures for sheep and the rest of the country generally consisted of extensive forests inhabited by tigers and other beasts of prey which were so destructive especially among the flocks that great hunting parties were made every spring for the purpose of destroying them and this dangerous sport seems to have been the favourite amusement of the sovereigns and great men of the land for a long series of years trade even with foreign nations appears to have been remarkably free the markets of china were the resorts of foreign merchants before the romans invaded britain and her ports were annually visited by great squadrons of commercial vessels from the red sea the persian gulf ceylon the malabar coast and the coast of coromandel the principal weapons used both in war and hunting were bows and arrows consequently the practice of archery was a constant and favourite sport of the great and there were particular rules by which it was conducted as for example the imperial target was the skin of a bear while that of a stag was set up as a mark for a prince to aim at and that of a tiger for the grandees of the court yet the chinese have not often during their long history attempted to enter the lists of the world as a martial nation holding literature as they have done husbandry in far higher estimation than military achievements regarding the man who distinguished himself by his literary attainments beyond him who gained renown by his warlike exploits and the husbandman who laboured in the field as a better member of society than the soldier who fought in it yet the petty princes were frequently at war with each other so that the whole of the empire was seldom quite at peace the education of youth was considered of so much importance that every district was obliged by law to maintain a public school where boys were sent at eight years of age to be instructed in reading writing arithmetic and in their several duties to parents teachers elders and magistrates as well as to their equals and inferiors they were also taught to commit to memory a great number of wise maxims and moral sentences contained in the writings of the ancient sages and many of their lessons were in verse that they might be the more readily learned and remembered a new school was always opened with much ceremony in the presence of the chief magistrate who delivered a discourse to the boys exhorting them to be diligent and submissive to the master and setting forth the advantages of learning which has been in every age the only road to wealth and honours in china at fifteen those who had most distinguished themselves were sent to higher schools where public lectures were given by learned professors on the laws and government of the empire and such subjects as were best calculated to fit them for offices of state to which those who attended these schools usually aspired but which were never bestowed on any but such as had studied profoundly and given proofs of their knowledge subordination submission to the laws to parents and to all superiors and a peaceful demeanour were strictly inculcated this instruction has continued unchanged the chinese says a modern writer teach contempt of the rude instead of fighting with them and the man who unreasonably insults another has public opinion against him whilst he who bears and despises the affront is esteemed a chinese would stand and reason with a man when an englishman would knock him down or an italian stab him it is needless to say which is the more rational mode of proceeding among the arts that are held in high estimation among the chinese is that of writing which was known at so distant a period of their history that it must have been one of their earliest steps in civilization this 
art as practised in china is rather difficult of attainment on account of the number and not very simple formation of the characters yet it was rare to meet even with a poor peasant who could not read and write for rich and poor were all educated alike in the manner just described which is mentioned as the ancient system in books that were written more than two thousand years ago the autographs of distinguished men are highly prized the females of china from the empress to the wife of the meanest peasant practised the spinning and weaving of silk which material from the earliest times known was used for clothing by the poor as well as the rich for the same reason that wool was used by the ancient english because it was the material of which they had the greatest abundance when the king of france says barrow introduced the luxury of silk stockings the peasantry of the middle provinces of china were clothed in silks from head to foot and when the nobility of england were sleeping on straw a peasant of china had his mat and his pillow and the man in office enjoyed his silken mattress the empresses in those days were as zealous in promoting the branches of industry adapted for females by their own example as were the emperors in encouraging agriculture by similar means a plantation of mulberry trees was formed within the gardens of the palace and a house built purposely for rearing the silkworms which were tended by the ladies of the court and often fed by the fair hands of royalty every autumn a festival was held to commemorate the invention of silk weaving when the empress attended by the princesses and ladies of her train made sacrifices in the temple of the earth and then proceeded to her mulberry grove where she gathered leaves and wound the cocoons of silk which were afterwards spun and woven by her own hands into small webs these were carefully preserved for the grand spring festival when they were burned in sacrifice great attention was bestowed on the management of silkworms throughout the whole of the empire and as it had been discovered that those which were fed on mulberry leaves produced a finer kind of silk than the common worms of the forest a law was made by one of the early emperors that every man possessing an estate of not less than five acres should plant the boundary with mulberry trees the difference between the garments of the higher and lower orders consisted in the quality and colours of the silks of which they were composed and the fashion in which they were made the robes of the grandees were often richly embroidered with gold and silver and ornamented with various devices according to their rank and occupation the dress of a literary man was ornamented with a bird worked on a square of black silk on the breast or with the figure of a tiger or some other animal or design and these are among the innumerable customs which have been continued from that time to the present the wars among the princes and the efforts of some of them to render themselves independent of the emperor led to a vast deal of disorderly conduct in the several states each petty sovereign being more intent upon his own aggrandizement than on keeping good order among his people who finding that the affairs of government were neglected and the law seldom enforced paid very little attention to them such was the state of the chinese empire when the celebrated philosopher confucius was born in the kingdom of lu one of the small sovereignties in the north of china this event occurred when the ancient greek republics were in all their glory and rome was just beginning to rise into power and greatness the greeks and romans however knew little or nothing of china at that time nor did the chinese imagine there was any truly great empire in the world besides their own an opinion they have maintained even until our own days but on the other hand it is manifest from the remains of great populous and magnificently built cities which stretch in a 
chain from the mediterranean sea to the countries now embraced by the chinese empire from the historic legends and philology of the nations existing there and from hints in the inspired history which the holy men of palestine have given us that there was kept up an intercourse by caravans across the continent and also by sea between the western and eastern sides of the continent the silk the cassia the camphor the broidered work the ivory the porcelain of china were known through the ages of the old jewish dispensation to the people of india central asia and phoenicia and her neighbours the vessels of solomon and hiram king of tyre sailed two monsoons eastward and two monsoons back a period of three years which connected them at the indian archipelago with the commerce which in like manner from the beginning of history has vibrated with the semi-annual monsoon up and down the china sea End of section ten. this recording is in the public domain Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. Section 11 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. Mencius by S. Wells Williams. Mencius was born about 400 B.C. in the city of Tsao, now in the province of shantung his father died a short time after his son's birth and left the guardianship of the boy to his widow chang shi the care of this prudent and attentive mother to quote from remusa has been cited as a model for all virtuous parents the house she occupied was near that of a butcher she observed that at the first cry of the animals that were being slaughtered the little mang ran to be present at the sight and that on his return he sought to imitate what he had seen fearful that his heart might become hardened and be accustomed to the sight of blood she removed to another house which was in the neighbourhood of a cemetery the relations of those who were buried there came often to weep upon their graves and make the customary libations mencius soon took pleasure in their ceremonies and amused himself in imitating them this was a new subject of uneasiness to chang shi she feared her son might come to consider as a jest what is of all things the most serious and that he would acquire a habit of performing with levity and as a matter of routine merely ceremonies which demand the most exact attention and respect again therefore she anxiously changed her dwelling and went to live in the city opposite to a school where her son found examples the most worthy of imitation and soon began to profit by them i should not have spoken of this trifling anecdote but for the allusion which the chinese constantly make to it in the common proverb formerly the mother of mencius chose out a neighbourhood on another occasion her son seeing persons slaughtering pigs asked her why they did it to feed you she replied but reflecting that this was teaching her son to lightly regard the truth went and bought some pork and gave him mencius devoted himself early to the classics and became the disciple of tsetse the grandson and not unworthy imitator of confucius after his studies were completed he offered his services to the feudal princes of the country and was received by hui wang king of hui but though much respected by this ruler his instructions were not regarded he saw too ere long that among the numerous petty rulers and intriguing statesmen of the day there was no prospect of restoring tranquillity to the empire 
and that discourses upon the mild government and peaceful virtues of yao and shun king wan and ching tang offered little to interest persons whose minds were engrossed with schemes of conquest or pleasure he therefore at length returned to his own country and in concert with his disciples employed himself in composing the work which bears his name and in completing the editorial labours of his great predecessor he died about three sixteen b c aged eighty four years End of section eleven this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twelve of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia a story of mencius by unknown a certain ruler said to him i am not at present able to do with the levying of a tithe only and abolishing the duties charged at the passes and in the markets with your leave i will lighten however both the tax and the duties until next year and will then make an end of them what do you think of such a course mencius said here is a man who every day appropriate some of his neighbour's strayed fowls some one said to him such is not the way of a good man and he replied with your leave i will diminish my appropriations and will take only one fowl a month until next year when i will make an end of the practice if you know that a thing is unrighteous then use all dispatch in putting an end to it why wait till next year end of section twelve this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section thirteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia proverbs of mencius beware what proceeds from you will return to you again he who loves others is constantly loved by them he that respects others is constantly respected by them respect the old and be kind to the young be not forgetful of strangers and travellers the path of duty lies in what is near and men seek for it in what is remote if each man would love his parents and show due respect to his elders the whole empire would enjoy tranquillity end of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section fourteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia china part three times of change and confusion historical note by the sixth century b c luxury misrule and petty warfare had impoverished the nation but with the rise of the tsin dynasty in two fifty five b c its prosperity was restored huang ti greatest of the tsin monarchs abolished the feudal system extended the bounds of the empire drove back the tartars and built the great wall to prevent their further incursions it was from the tsin dynasty that the country received its name tsinna or china during the reign of the hans the next line of rulers 
buddhism was introduced libraries founded and a system of civil service instituted but in the second century a d the nation again fell into confusion and for four hundred years suffered the oppression of feeble and vicious rulers End of section fourteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section fifteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifteen the strenuous reign of huang ti by rev charles gutzlaff in spite of all the good advice of confucius laotze and mencius the affairs of the kingdom did not go on very smoothly by and by people began to whisper that a change was surely coming centuries before this the ruler yu had set up some brazen vessels with the name of some one of the states on each it was reported that they had been seen to shake violently worse than this a mountain fell into the huang ho river turned the stream from its course and caused terrible floods the central government grew weaker the separate states stronger and finally the prince of the state of tsin became emperor in two forty six b c huang ti ascended the throne he was only thirteen years old but in one way or another he usually succeeded in having his own will the editor before wang ti had succeeded to the throne he had contracted an intimacy with the hereditary prince of yen called tan when he was seated upon the throne tan paid him a visit but was coldly received which made him return to his own country with disappointment on his return than yu ke an imperial general having fallen into disgrace had fled to yen the emperor set a price upon his head but tan refused to violate the laws of hospitality though tan appeared very sincere in his regard toward fan yu ki he kept him at his court only with the view of revenging the insult he had received a crafty man called king ko was sent to fan yu ki in order to acquaint him with the dreadful fate his family had suffered by the tsin tyrant on his own account you he added will very soon fall a victim to the tyrant i advise you therefore to commit suicide i shall carry your head to the tyrant and whilst he is viewing it i shall bury this poignard in his breast thus you will revenge your family and the empire will be freed from slavery van yuki listened with attention he was enchanted with the prospect and cut his throat king ko hastened with his head to huang ti prostrated himself and presented it in a box to the emperor whilst he was examining it king ko drew his poniard but the emperor perceived it in good time he started parried the blow of the assassin received the wound in his leg and thus saved his life king ko was in despair at having missed so good an opportunity of dispatching the monster and again darted his dagger at him which merely grazed the imperial robes after having upon examination found out that the prince of yen had hired the assassin he attacked yen drove the king out of his capital to li yu tung and not yet satisfied with having inflicted so heavy a punishment he satiated his revenge to surfeit by exterminating the whole family 
constantly directing his attention to gain the one great object universal dominion he defeated all the machinations of the minor princesses by a steady course of policy and they were all finally subdued huang ti who had before only borne the name of ching wang as soon as he saw himself the sole master of the whole empire adopted the title of emperor puffed up by his many victories he thought himself by no means inferior to any of the preceding worthies shin nung yao and shun he therefore adopted the epithet of che beginning first which he placed before the title of emperor the imperial colour was changed to black and a regular system of despotism introduced but he did not forget the improvement of his country astronomy during the many troubles of the states had fallen into disuse he re-established it and published a calendar anxious to obliterate all the memory of sanguinary conquest he ordered all the arms to be brought to his capital hin yang and obliged his numerous soldiers to settle themselves in this city where he endeavoured to surpass all his predecessors in luxury and magnificence the palace was tastefully laid out and enriched with the spoils of many kingdoms but the ease of the court could not soften the prince he visited all the provinces of the empire made his own observations and even penetrated to the great ocean with scarcely any train he traversed valleys and plains always intent upon his duty his vigorous mind was restless he could not brook the reproaches of the literati nor conform to their advice of introducing the old order of things he wished to be a founder not a restorer of an empire even in the prevalent superstition he dared to introduce innovations and to offer sacrifices according to his own fancy being almost drowned whilst crossing a river he inquired about the cause the spirit of a mountain which was pointed out to him received all the credit he therefore had the mountain laid bare of all its trees and herbs in order to revenge himself for the insult at another time he dispatched some young men and women in search of the islands of immortality which he was told were situated toward the east the adventurers were driven back from thence by a very heavy gale and returned without bringing with them the liquor of immortality but one of their number who had been driven in a different direction reported to the emperor that he had landed at the isles of immortality where he had found a manuscript which stated that the tsin empire was to end by hu wang ti lent a willing ear to this impostor and immediately resolved to attack the huang nu or huns for these he understood were the hu which would put an end to the reign of his family the huns this scourge of the civilized world dated their empire from one of the princes of the hay dynasty their country was of great extent situated on the west of shen shi of which they possess the western parts and their posterity still inhabit a part of that territory the present l they belong to that extrinsic tribe which the ancients comprised under the name of scythians the country they inhabited was so barren as to render agriculture little available to the maintenance of life their indolent pastoral habits had for them greater attractions than the constant toil of the chinese peasant hunting was their chief amusement and next to their herds their principal means of subsistence without the arts of civilized life they were cruel and bloodthirsty desirous of conquest and insatiable in rapine their victorious arms were only bounded by the eastern ocean the thinly inhabited territories along the banks of the amur acknowledged their sway they conquered countries near the irdish and imaeus nothing could stop them but the ice-fields of the arctic 
arctic seas their principal strength was in their innumerable cavalry which appears to have been very skilful in the use of the bow their march was checked by neither mountains nor torrents they swam over the deepest rivers and surprised with rapid impetuosity the camps of their enemies against such hordes no military tactics no fortifications proved of any avail they carried all before them with irresistible power and never waited until a numerous army could be assembled to overwhelm them hardy to an extreme they could support fatigue and hunger and never lost view of the object of all their excursions plunder huang ti surprised and sought to extirpate these fierce barbarians and finding them unprepared the conquest was very easy his generals having subdued the people in the south nothing more remained to be done than to subdue these tartars or at least to put a stop to their inroads some of the northern states had eventually built a wall to keep those unbidden guests out of their territories huang ti resolved to erect a monument of his enterprising spirit which would be a lasting memorial of his greatness this was the building of the great wall which commences in the western part of shenshi and terminates in the mountains of li u tung in the sea a distance of more than fifteen hundred miles it runs over hills and rivers through valleys and plains and is perhaps the most stupendous work ever produced by human labour he lined it with fortresses erected towers and battlements and built it so broad that six horsemen might ride abreast upon it to lay the foundation in the sea several vessels loaded with ballast were sunk and upon this the wall was erected every third man in the kingdom was required to work on it the enormous work was finished within five years but the founder had not the satisfaction of seeing it completed during these immense pursuits the emperor was often interrupted in his work by the representations of the literati who desired to restore ancient customs and revert to the glorious times of yao and shun the emperor fond of innovations anxious to perpetuate his name by extraordinary works was highly dissatisfied with their observations let's see his prime minister advised him therefore to put a stop to all similar remarks by burning the ancient books probably the emperor had made up his mind long before the matter came up in his council but the following is what let's see is reported to have said your majesty has laid the foundations of imperial sway so that it will last for ten thousand generations this is indeed beyond what a stupid scholar can understand and moreover you only talks of things belonging to the three dynasties which are not fit to be models to you at other times when the princes were all striving together they endeavoured to gather the wandering scholars about them but now the empire is in a stable condition laws and ordinances issue from one supreme authority let those of the people who abide in their homes give their strength to the toils of husbandry and those who become scholars should study the various laws and prohibitions instead of doing this however the scholars do not learn what belongs to the present day but study antiquity they go on to condemn the present time leading the masses of the people astray and to disorder at the risk of my life i the prime minister say formerly when the empire was disunited and disturbed there was no one who could give unity to it the princes therefore stood up together constant references were made to antiquity to the injury of the present state baseless statements were dressed up to confound what was real and men made a boast of their own peculiar learning to condemn what the rulers appointed 
and now when your majesty has consolidated the empire and distinguishing black from white has made it a stable unity they still honor their peculiar learning and combine together they teach men what is contrary to your laws when they hear that an ordinance has been issued every one sets to discussing it with his learning in the court they are dissatisfied in heart out of it they keep talking in the streets while they make a pretence of vaunting their master they consider it fine to have extraordinary views of their own and so they lead on the people to be guilty of murmuring and evil speaking if these things are not prohibited your majesty's authority will decline and parties will be formed the best way is to prohibit them i pray that all the records in charge of the historiographers be burned excepting those of tsin that with the exception of those officers belonging to the board of great scholars all throughout the empire who presume to keep copies of the shi king or shu king or of the books of the hundred schools be required to go with them to the officers in charge of the several districts and burn them that all who may dare to speak together about the shi and the shu be put to death and their bodies exposed in the market-place that those who make mention of the past so as to blame the present be put to death along with their relatives that officers who shall know of the violation of those rules and not inform against the offenders be held equally guilty with them and that whoever shall not have burned their books within thirty days after the issuing of the ordinance be branded and sent to labour on the wall for four years the only books which shall be spared are those of medicine divination and husbandry whoever wants to learn the laws may go to the magistrates and learn of them the imperial decision was approved end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain